It's part two of our interview with Rick Emmett of Triumph fame. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Before you hear from Rick, remember, subscribe to our channel. In the next few weeks, we'll have reached 60,000 subscribers, which to us is amazing. There's a lot of hard work in there. So please subscribe and share our videos and comment on them as well. Here's Rick Emmett. When you, you had mentioned in an interview, it was all over the Facebook yesterday, I noticed you mentioned that you guys were in the shadow of Rush. And when, when you had said that, I, I was nice. I noticed that. And you're always going to get your fans. You're, it's, it's, your, it's your posse. They were going, no way, man. And I, I, I always like when that happens because like the Triumph people came out and they went, no way, man. I actually like Triumph a lot more. And I mean, obviously people who bought a lot of your solo albums, Bruce Hornsby brought me to blues. I hated blues. And you know me, I've been exposed to all kinds of music. Oh my God, I've been in radio so many years. But when Bruce Hornsby did it, then I accepted it. When Bruce Hornsby did like his new album, I've got it. I got it early. And it's so avant-garde. It's just way out there. But it's Bruce. So I'm sure there must have been a lot of people who came to your concerts and you you helped them open the door a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I always felt like, um, and it, I guess this goes back maybe a little bit to that whole uh, pedantic kind of teacher thing that, that um, I always felt like it, it wasn't enough just to entertain. There also had to be a level of informing um, and even challenging on a certain level that it's going to like, we're going to expand our consciousness a little bit, you know? And I mean, obviously I loved artists like, like Bruce Coburn was a guy, he would challenge, you know, Dylan's lyrics would challenge people, you know, and he would say like, I don't care. I don't care if you, if you don't like it or not, I'm sticking it in your face. You know, th this is what's going to happen. You know, um, you know, I was a little bit more sort of, um, gentle about it and a little bit more, you know, uh, I would try and be more seductive in my approach, but I was going to try and sort of elevate the discussion a little bit, elevate the atmosphere a little bit. Um, and I mean, Rush had a lot of that. They were a very, uh, on a certain level, pedagogical kind of thing. Like there was technique in what they wanted to do. There was, um, you know, a, a really heavy duty uh, ensemble integration thing that was occurring in whatever that band chose to do, which was that's a very progressive state of mind that, you know, no, we're, we're going to play in odd time signatures and just to show you that we can. And we're going to do it really, really well just to show you that we can, you know. Um, and Triumph didn't really have any of that, you know. So when it came to, um, like when I originally uh, wrote the song Blinding Light Show, which was on the first Triumph record, uh, and I was in a band called Act Three, and it was a much more progressive, much more like a rush. It would probably have been much more like a rush kind of thing if it had survived. It didn't survive me leaving to go to Triumph. It, it, the drummer from that band ended up becoming the front man for a band called Zon, uh, which CBS signed later, but and it became a different thing. But there, there, then again, you can see that theatrical nature that he had, you know, that would have been part of Act 3. I would have been in a band that would have maybe had that. So uh, Triumph was, you know, um, uh, this thing that, that uh, it, we were always trying to be um, uh, accessible in a way that maybe Rush wasn't, you know. But we owed so much to Rush because of the fact that they – they were they were big. They were really big, and they were big in in, a, in an international kind of high echelon kind of way. They made un, unbelievably great, outstanding sounding records, uh, and they had this progressive chip on their shoulder constantly. You know, um, and we were more about you know let's let's write some songs that'll really work when we play arenas. You know, so. Um, and I think in the end, the loyalty of Triumph fans is because of songs like Magic Power and Lay It on the Line and Fight the Good Fight and, you know, Ordinary Man. Those kinds of songs, those evergreen tunes for Triumph, they're more of that FMAOR kind of a little bit more than, than which is not to say Rush doesn't have it too. They do. But they weren't, they weren't tune writers. They weren't necessarily... They would, you know, create their songs from from parts 
you know, oh, Alex has got this riff and Getty's written this thing and, and Neil wants to play these fills over this time signature. So they would stick that all together and progressive stuff is often like that. When you listen to Dream Theater, it's like, that's a lot of that. Like it's very, it's not really a song. You're not hearing somebody's tune, you know? Um, so, but Triumph was more about just kind of songs, you know? So we kind of get fans that are very loyal because that's what they like. They can really sink their teeth into that, you know, but guys that are air drummers, they're going to pick Russian every time. Oh God. Yeah. When you would get home after a tour, finished a tour for an album in this, any one of these albums that you're re-releasing, what was your mindset? Did you go home? The album's released, the tour's done. When you came home, what was your mindset? Were you already thinking of the next project while you were on that tour promoting that album? Were you already creating for the next project? Because I'm just trying to get into your mind because you've covered so much ground with these solo albums. I mean, tons of ground, obviously, more than most artists would. Yeah, but, but I think the answer to your question is a yes and no. And the yes part of it is that, and, and the no part of it, at the same time, the touring that I did, it was sort of like never ending because I, it wasn't like I, I did it in it. When you're really, really huge, let's say you're Def Leppard and then somebody says, well, we're going to go to Australia. And then somebody puts together, you know, a, a month, three weeks or a month. And you're going there and you're going to be, li you're, you're going to be living in hotels and traveling on the buses and flying in the planes. And you're going to do that for a month. But my life was more like, hey, do you want to go out this weekend and, and we can put, you know, two dates in and around St. Louis so you can have a weekend in St. Louis. So you're more like a traveling salesman that you're going to go out and do. The, and my gigs didn't always relate to one album's release. It would be like I'd go out and somebody would say, you know, hey, you know, you and Dave Dunlop could do a folk duo thing in this club. But then on the Saturday, there's an outdoor festival in peoria and they would like to have the classic rock band so you can fly the other musicians in and, and do that gig and then on sunday there's a guy that would like to do a kitchen concert and he's willing to pay a lot of money you know so you could do that so that make make your weekend up so even when i was out touring i was bouncing around like a ping ball ping pong ball in a in a windstorm you know and then your brain has to kind of come to terms with that that that's what your life is like so now creatively, in my, in my notebooks, when I would write, I'd, be, I'd come up with an idea, there'd be a lyric, and you know, I would say, right, eventually this is going to end up on a singer-songwriter record when I gather that pile of stuff together. Whereas, oh, this little idea, this is definitely like a fingerstyle jazz thing, and I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to prostitute these ideas or, 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 or uh, bend them i don't want to bang square pegs into round holes here i'm just gonna the square pegs go over here the round pegs go over there the octagonal pegs go, you know like i just want to organize myself so that you know i won't be necessarily shooting myself in the foot when it comes to putting out whatever boutique thing you know will accumulate to the point where it's time for it to come out you know um so that was kind of how how the process worked for years and years and years and years. And um, it hasn't really changed, you know. Um, although things come along, like back in uh, 2016, I got a call and a guy says, hey, you know, I'm sort of functioning A&R for the mascot label. And, uh, you know, I, I think we can make a deal. Would you like to make a rock record again? Like serious rock record. And I went, uh, well, are you talking serious money to get it done? And they go, oh, yeah, we'll give you six figures. And I go, okay, American? Yes. I go, okay, uh, it can be done, you know. So the deal gets done. I put a band together, go to the studio. And I made this record, Resolution Res 9, with, uh, with a band that I called Resolution 9 in 2016. And I, I felt great. It was a real nice record to make. I had Paul DeLong playing drums and my touring guy, Steve Skingley, and Dave Dunlop playing guitar. Uh, got Don Bright up to come play some keys on it and stuff. And it just turned out really, really good. But it's a one-off. It's just like, it, it's same like somebody saying, hey, you want to go play this classic rock festival in Vancouver? Like, it really was just kind of like a one-off. And then I'm back to my normal life, which is okay. I think I'm going to work on this little classical guitar piece for a bit, you know. I just went, I just turned 60 in February. 
And that was the age for me. I just interviewed Bill Bruford and he said, oh my God, the 60s were the best. You know, like the, when he was 60, he said, when I was 60, I, I felt uncomfortable with my body, but yet comfortable because I knew I, it, wasn't, I, it wasn't the guy who didn't know what he didn't know. He said, I started sort of figuring things out before that happened. But he says, my body didn't like it. But at the same time, because he quit drumming, right? He just couldn't drum anymore. Yeah. But so anyway, that's why I'm, I'm doing this. When I'm having an autistic daughter, I realize that it's hard for her to switch gears, to change her file. She has to have a file, quit, quit the file, and then go to the next file. Wait a minute. You said at 11 we were going to do this. We have to do it at 11. Now, for you, I look at you and I'm going, you're able to change your file very easily. When you were in Triumph, could you have done that then? Were you that type of guy all the time of being able to, okay, that goes, that song goes in that category, like you were saying. A lot of people can't do that. It's very difficult for people to do that. Well, um, you know, I mean, there, there's an irony in, in what you're saying, because if my wife, you know, poked her head in the, and heard you say that, she would kill herself laughing, because I'm terrible at stuff. Uh, for example, um, you know, it's, it's time to wash the dishes. And I'm washing the dishes, and I'm, I'm not even halfway through. And then I go, ooh, I just got an idea for a lyric. And I start wandering away, and I go and I get my notebook, and I and now the dishes aren't getting finished. And my wife's going, "I thought you were going to finish the dishes. You know, you're, you're supposed to be cleaning the kitchen." I go, "What? No, I I I had an idea, and and I would always prioritize my own creativity and the freedom of my creativity. That would always be, and so in a, in a sense, it makes you so that you're almost." like uh, attention deficit disorder like you're you're going to wander away and go off on a tangent and sometimes in truth like even um like say you're in the studio and and you're recording an overdub and you know it, it, this is a very narrow thing that you're pursuing but then oh all of these other things are starting to get in the way of the pursuing this thing so do i have the ability to focus in and Sometimes if I'm inspired, I, I'm like a laser focus that now it's like obsessive compulsive. You can't get me off of this tangent. Rick Emmett has reissued 11 of his solo albums. We'll have information on how you can pick them up in the description of this video. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. Mm -hmm.